The Autobiography of Madame Kion by Jean Kion. Volume 1, Chapter 2. I was born on April 18, 1648. My parents, particularly my father, were extremely pious, but to him it was a manner hereditary. Many of his forefathers were saints. My mother, in the eighth month, was accidentally frightened, which caused an abortion. It is generally imagined that a child born in that month cannot survive. Indeed, I was so excessively ill immediately after my birth that all about me despaired of my life and were apprehensive I should die without baptism. Perceiving some signs of vitality, they ran to acquaint my father, who immediately brought a priest, but on entering the chamber they were told those symptoms which had raised their hopes were only expiring struggles, and all was over. I had no sooner shown signs of life again than I again relapsed and remained so long in an uncertain state that it was some time before they could find a proper opportunity to baptize me. I continued very unhealthy until I was two and a half years old, when they sent me to the convent of the Ursulines, where I remained a few months. On my return, my mother neglected to pay due attention to my education. She was not fond of daughters, and abandoned me wholly to the care of servants. Indeed, I should have suffered severely from their inattention to me had not an all-watchful providence been my protector. For through my liveliness I met with various accidents. I frequently fell into a deep vault that held our firewood. However, I always escaped unhurt. The Duchess of Mount Benson came to the convent of the Benedictines when I was about four years old. She had a great friendship for my father and obtained his permission that I should go to the same convent. She took peculiar delight in my sportiveness and certain sweetness in my external deportment. I became her constant companion. I was guilty of frequent and dangerous irregularities in this house and committed serious faults. I had good examples before me, and being naturally well inclined, I followed them when there were none to turn me aside. I loved to hear God spoken of, to be at church, and to be dressed in a religious garb. I was told of terrors of hell, which I imagine was intended to intimidate me, as I was exceedingly lively and full of a little petulant vivacity, which they call wit. The succeeding night I dream of hell, and though I was so young, time has never been able to efface the frightful ideas impressed upon my imagination. All appear horrible darkness, where souls were punished, and my place among them was pointed out. At this I wept bitterly and cried, O oh my God, if thy wilt have mercy upon me, and spare me yet a little longer, I will never more offend thee. And thou didst, O Lord, in mercy hearken unto my cry, 
and pour upon me strength and courage to serve thee in an uncommon manner for one of my age. I wanted to go privately to confession, but being little, the mistress of the boarders carried me to the priest and stayed with me while I was hurt. She was much astonished when I mentioned that I had suggestions against the faith, and the confessor began to laugh and inquire what they were. I told him that till then I had doubted there was such a place as hell, and supposed my mistress had spoken of it merely to make me good, but now my doubts were all removed. After confession, my heart glowed with a kind of fervor, and at one time I felt a desire to suffer martyrdom. The good girls of the house, to amuse themselves, and to see how far this growing favor would carry me, desired me to prepare for martyrdom. I found great fervency and delight in prayer, and was persuaded that this ardor, which was as new as it was pleasing, was a proof of God's love. This inspired me with such courage and resolution that I earnestly besought them to proceed, that I might thereby enter into His sacred presence but was not there not latent hypocrisy here? Did I not imagine that it was possible they would not kill me, and that I would have the merit of martyrdom without suffering it? Indeed, it appeared there was something of this nature in it. Being placed kneeling on a cloth spread for the purpose, and seeing behind me a large short lifted up, which they had prepared, to try how far my ardor would carry me, I cried, Hold! It is not right I should die without first obtaining my father's permission. I was quickly upbraided with having said this, that I might escape, and that I was no longer a martyr, I continue long disconsolate, I will receive no comfort. Something inwardly reproved me for not having embraced that opportunity of going to heaven when it rested altogether on my choice. At my solicitation, and on account of my failing so frequently sick, I was at length taken home. On my return, my mother, having a maid in whom she placed confidence, left me again to the care of the servants. It is a great fault of which mothers are guilty, when, under pretext of external devotions or other engagements, they suffer their daughters to be absent from them. I forbear not condemning that a just partiality with which parents treat some of their children. It is frequently productive of divisions in families and even the ruin of some. Impartiality, by uniting children's hearts together, lays the foundation of lasting harmony and unanimity. I would I were able to convince parents and all who have the care of youth of the great attention they require and how dangerous it is to let them be for any length of time from under their eye or to suffer them to be without some kind of employment. This negligence is the ruin of multitudes of girls. How greatly it is to be lamented that mothers who are inclined to piety should pervert even the means of salvation to their destruction. 
commit the greatest irregularities while apparently pursuing that which should produce the most regular and circumspect conduct thus because they experience certain gains in prayer they would be all day long at church meanwhile their children are running to destruction we glorify god most when we prevent what may offend him what must be the nature of that sacrifice which is the occasion of sin god should be served in his own way let the devotion of mothers be regulated so as to prevent their daughters from straying treat them as sisters not as slaves appear pleased with their little amusements the children would delight then in the presence of their mothers instead of avoiding it if they find so much happiness with them they will not dream of seeking it elsewhere mothers frequently deny their children any liberties like birds constantly confined to a cage they no sooner find means of escape than off they go never to return in order to render them tame and docile when young they should permit it sometimes to take wing but as they fly is weak and closely watched it is easy to retake them when they escape little fly gives them the habit of naturally returning to their cage which becomes an agreeable confinement i believe young girls should be treated in a manner something similar to this mothers should indulge them in an innocent liberty but should never lose sight of them to guard the tender minds of children from what is wrong much care should be taken to employ them in agreeable and useful matters they should not be loaded with food they cannot release milk sweeted to babies should be administered to them not strong meat which may so disgust them that when they arrive at an age when it will be proper nourishment they will not so much as taste it every day they should be obliged to read a little in some good book spend some time in prayer which must be suited rather to steer the affections than for meditation oh were this method of education pursued how speedily would many irregularities cease these daughters becoming mothers would educate their children as they themselves had been educated parents should also avoid showing the smallest partiality in the treatment of their children it begets a secret jealousy and hatred among them which frequently augments with time and even continues until death how often do we see some children the idols of the house behaving like absolute tyrants treating their brothers and sisters as so many slaves according to the example of father and mother and it happens many times that the favor proves a scourge to the parents while the poor despised and hated ones become their consolation and support my mother was very defective in the education of her children she suffered me whole days from her presence in company with the servants whose conversation and example 
were particularly hurtful to one of my disposition. My mother's heart seemed wholly centered in my brother. I was scarcely ever favored with the smallest instance of her tenderness or affection. I, therefore, voluntarily absented myself from her. It is true that my brother was more amiable than I, but the excess of her fondness for him made her blind even to my outward good qualities. It served only to discover my faults, which would have been trifling had proper care been taken of me. End of chapter 2, volume 1